So, who's ready for a bit of revolutionary politics? Yeah. <laughs> That's great, because the next session promises to be good. <laughs> Actually, I, if you can bear with me, I'm here to, I guess, talk a little bit about um, some of the things that are happening in Australia, um, and also a little bit about, um, I guess, how I see um, political activism as a means of positive social response to um, violence and oppression. I also bring greetings from our elders in Australia, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And here is Walter and Dool and Leisha Eats. And, oops, I've stuffed it already. <laughs> and Samuel Pilot kick it on the didgeridoo. So that's how they do their welcome to country for us. And we are very honoured when they come and do that for us. I firstly want to touch on, I guess, something you may already be aware of, but um, it's very prominently happening in our state and the state that I live in, in Western Australia, which is um, the closure and removal of Aboriginal people from remote areas of, of the um, state. Um, Tony Abbott, who's our Prime Minister in his wisdom, has decided that he will no longer provide funding that's needed for um, water, clean water and electricity. So essentially 100 to, and to 150 um, communities will be forced off their land. And so this has mobilised people, the, I guess the condemning of this action has mobilised people not only within our state, states around Australia and other countries of the world. Um, so there were rallies, this is the rally that we had in Perth um, just less than a week ago. It was on May Day, actually. So this was the second call to action. So people, you know, there have been previous actions and um, I guess the momentum's been built and people are seeing, you know, that the, the flawed policies of the past are continuing by this sort of action. So, um, rightly so, people were all gathering to protest about this um, forced removal. And I guess what's happened since the government's been getting some overwhelmingly um, long letters and, and outrageous sort of um, comments about what they're doing, they're now softening their language and saying, well, we're not actually removing anyone. We're giving people a life choice. And, um, you know, it's up to them whether they take it and we're going to, you know, make sure they go to hubs where there's more facilities. And so they're trying to soften it all now because there's been so much outrage. And, you know, it was great to see that rallies were held in Berlin, Los Angeles, London and Aotearoa. So I'm going to talk a little bit about solidarity work as well in my presentation. So just to put that um, in the forefront because it is such a big issue in our state. Um, and of course the Women's Council, who I work for, has written to our Premier quite severely and, and um, I'm expecting um, some response when I get back to Perth about that, that letter we've sent. So I really want to just set the context, um, social and material context about violence against women because essentially patriarchy is still alive and kicking as we know it and um, it is what we believe the root cause of violence against women and until we address it in all its forms we will still um, see poor social responses, we will still see women not getting justice, women dying etc. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, and also racial oppression. So if we look at the history in WA and we know that patriarchy and, and oppression of women has been around for centuries but if we just have a quick snapshot um, about in Western, again, Western Australia um, when the Swan Colony in, invaded I mean what they brought was their attitudes and beliefs 
around husband and wife regarded as one person under the law, um, with the husband being that person, the husband was the head of the household with absolute authority um, over the household, over his wife's body and over the children. So I guess you can see this picture of you know, power, domination, um, oppression, entrapment, particularly for women could not enter into any legal contracts. Divorce was only possible through an act of parliament and of course desertion of the bread in that plunged women into poverty. And so we couldn't vote, had no legal rights under the law and were classified as second class citizens. And just on that, I, I have to give an ode to my old man because as I was sort of growing up, you know, he always would tell me that I was a second class citizen. And, you know, he wasn't on his own in that. This was the era where, you know, women in particular were told this. And I thought about it the other day. In fact, I thought about it when I mentioned it in uh, Tararoa. And I thought, you know, he's still alive. Poor old mum's gone because she couldn't cope with, you know, what was going on there with him. But I thought, you know, he's 88 in June. And I thought I should say to him, hey, Dad. Remember, you know, when you used to say to me I was a second-class citizen and just say to him, um, you know, and who do you suppose were the first-class citizens? Because you guys would have been third. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I thought, that's what you call payback. Never too late for a bit of payback, <laughs> you know? And I thought, I reckon I might must have the courage to do that before <laughs> Leaves, leaves us, you know, because I just thought, who was he? You know, and of course he'd be outraged. Of course he'd be going, what touchy one, what touchy one, me, me, me. You know, he'd always be thinking of him as number one. You know, and I'd be going, okay, a little bit of payback wouldn't hurt. You know? <laughs> so historically, you know, women have been excluded and misrepresented as others. And I guess during this whole time of women's oppression. Alongside that's been the genocidal attempts and the violent attacks and racial oppression upon Aboriginal people, um, which was supported by Acts of Parliament such as our Aborigines Act of 1905, which then um, was introduced in South Africa in 1948 by the National Party, um, which actually supported the introduction of apartheid. So they took from that act, from that um, oppressive act that, you know, banished people to reserves and, you know, you were um, classified. I mean, in Australia, you were classified full blood, half blood, um, half caste, and so on. In South Africa, it was slightly different. It was um, African, coloured, Africana, etc. So they had, and it was based on skin colour. And in fact, when I was over there once and I was in an accident and had to be taken to hospital, and it was interesting because um, I had an ANC Women's League t-shirt on, you know, and anyway, I was sort of not quite conscious and this big Africana matron came out and she said, she took one look at me and she said, she saw the t-shirt and she was outraged basically, and she said, do they have blacks in in Australia and she was waiting for me to say no because she thought oh, you know I'm not, they were going to classify me and I just looked at her and I went yep and she said into the African ward with her and of course I was delighted but she thought she was punishing me you see and I just thought you know acts, little acts of defiance go a long way and so we had a great time together and my friends would come in and bring food and she was totally outraged because I'd share the food with people and she'd come in at night and go, is there any food for me? And I said, oh, sorry, it's all gone. But what they would do, they'd torment you psychologically. So she'd come in with a needle and put it in the drip and she'd say, go slowly. And you'd be thinking, what the hell is she, she on about here? And all the other women said, no, we think we're being poisoned. They're putting stuff into the bloody drip. We're feeling crook. You know, people are pulling their drips out, and I thought, oh my God, you know. But the one really interesting thing about it, I never broke a bone in my body, but it was all bruised, and I was actually black. So it was sort of interesting, in a sense. There was this sort of thing going on about, you know, um, me aligning myself with, with um, the black people of South Africa. So it was just, yeah, another experience. 
But again, I mean, our Aboriginal people were um, classified as fauna and flora. You know, when um, white man invaded, you know, we were terra nullis. No one, it was uninhibited. And so, you know, it was only in 1962 that um, people were asked, should we, you know, have Aboriginal people give them the vote? And that they won that referendum, and it wasn't until 1967 that Aboriginal women and men got the vote for the first time. So, quite a, you know, huge um, injustice that was going on there. So, of course, they were never able to get ahead because their voices were never heard. So, women's refuges across Australia were really a response to violence against women. They were a time when, um, I guess our mothers and grandmothers suffered in silence. The, there was, it was a time of desperation, it was a time of anger, and it was a time where women um, and feminists basically squatted on, on a vacant house in Sydney, and that became known as Elsie's Place and was the first feminist refuge. There were other sort of shelters around, but they weren't feminist because what they did, they took women in for a couple of days, but it was only respite, and they never addressed the issue of of domestic violence and what was happening um, when they were living with a violent partner. So really that's why um, the feminist refuges really arose in that early 70s period. And Nardine in WA was also the first one there in 74. So it was really about how few options there were for women. And so they did a lot around, I guess, um, raising the awareness that this sort of so-called private violence must stop and it must become, you know, public concern. So it's, the group I worked for was established in 1977 and it was nine refuges um, that came together and said we want one voice, we want to um, put the issue firmly on the government state agenda um, and we want to, I guess, um, we want to bring about social change because, you know, enough is enough. And I guess when I started working in the job in 95, because I've previously worked in a refuge for six years, but went to this job, they defunded, the minister defunded all the peak bodies and said, we don't want political act, you know, advocacy. We don't want to hear from you guys. We're pulling the pin. So uh, youth, uh, homelessness, women's, and what we call WACOS, which is a general um, council of social services, all got defunded. There were seven. And um, I said, well, we need someone to come in for six months and just help get things going again. And that was my brief. You know, can you please try and get some funding back to the agency? And the funny thing about it, I've just been to South Africa for a, a couple of years off and on, and learned so much from the struggle there. And I remember getting a phone call from the head of the government's DCP, which is like social services, saying, oh, I heard you got the job with the Women's Refuge Group. And I thought, well, for fuck's sake, excuse the language, but how did you get my home number? It's a silent number for starters. And what are you doing sort of ringing me? Anyway, I said, oh, I've heard you're an activist and I've heard you've been to South Africa. And I said, what bloody file are you looking at? <laughs> you know, so it was really a bit daunting. And I just sort of said, yes, I have. And yes, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm in the role to try and, um, you know, raise a few issues. I didn't let on too much, but I just thought, you know, the indignity of that, as if to say, we're watching you, you know. And that was it. So that was red rag to a ball. And then I went out, all stops, all stops. It was, you know, we um, got the Chief Justice, who is a very progressive, he's just passed away, actually, David Malcolm, who'd done the first gender bias task force in WA. And there was over 100 recommendations about, um, you know, gender bias within the law. And he came and spoke at a breakfast where there was about 200 people. The media came. We got it all set up and then bang, it hit the front page of the paper the next day and that was the end of it. They rang up, they said, oh, we want to refund you. And I said, oh, that's good, that's nice. But, we, you know, we can talk. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, annual funding. I said, no, 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 no more annual funding. 
that's it. You want us to operate as a viable community organisation, we need three years funding. And so it was on, you know. So basically I learned so much when I was in South Africa about how you, you hold that ground, how you hold that space, how you can, you know, I guess try and be a bit fearless around those things because they were thinking we'll get a, in a place that wasn't happening. I got to meet some fabulous people, Winnie Mandela, Joe Slovo, who was, you know, an amazing um, leader in the ANC um, alongside Mandela. He was one of his right-hand people. Person. The only regret I do have is that um, someone had said to me when we were at the headquarters, do you want to come and meet Madiba? And I went, oh, God, no, he's too busy. I said, you can't do that. So I didn't go in. But a year later, my son was asked to meet him at Joe Slobo's funeral. So it was quite an amazing thing that happened there as well. He got that opportunity. So just a little bit about that. This is some of the refuge groups. So I don't work alone. I have you know, a number of people. And Regina's here today. Say hi, Regina. Hi. Regina's here from Western Australia and is the assistant manager of Arana House. So. It's fabulous that you can be here. So this is only some of us who work together, mainly refuge managers, and strategise about, you know, what we're going to do, what are the issues on the ground, how do we um, move forward um, with so many challenges around funding, funding cuts, um, competitive tendering. Do you have that here? Where you have to tender for services against other services? We have a lot of that in, in Western Australia and Australia. So we sort of get together and strategise around those things. So despite you know gender equality, women in Australia have made some significant advances, we do agree. But I guess it's that whole story about um, you know, two steps forward and one step back. You know, we're constantly sort of having to you know, people think you've got to win and, and you're fine, but it's generally under attack, under a Liberal government definitely under attack and so you always have to try and again hold on to those gains sometimes they are lost and I think you know this is the importance of you know trying to keep political in terms of what you think is going to be the agenda and what you start to hear will be an agenda when there's a, a change of government you know so we've had quite a lot of you know things around Equal Opportunity Act, CEDAW Convention for the Elimination of Violence Against All Good um, and All Its Forms. So, you know, I guess we've seen a whole lot of things happen. We've had a female um, Governor General, Prime Minister, Premiers, all those types of things. But still, violence against women remains the leading contributor to death, disability, and in illness in women aged 15 to 44. So, it's time for it to stop. We've got national plans and that's great and that's commendable, but um, you know, they don't often deliver um, you know, all the things that are needed. We've got some initiatives such as Safe at Home, so instead of women having to flee their home, women can actually stay in their home where it's safe to do so. And so um, a number of us advocated for that model because we felt it was very unjust that women and children always had to be the ones leaving. So for the last four years in Western Australia, that model's been operating and helps um, 300 women and around 700 children each year to, to remain in their, in their home. Or if they find that they can't actually remain in that home, they can be relocated and, but still get this support, this sort of wraparound support for around 12 months while they get their lives and get the violent partner um, out of the picture. Okay. The other one that we've got is um, domestic violence rights and entitlements. So now there's Pacific leave for victims of domestic and family violence. Around 1.6 million workers are covered through these domestic violence clauses. And so they don't have to eat into their sick leave or any other entitlements they can get this specific leave to attend court, to you know, um, see to their children's schooling, 
to um, attend counselling if that's what they've chosen, to upgrade security, etc. And I think the highest one organisation, um, which was a, not a not for profit, but it was a gov local government, gave four weeks additional. But what they find is it's not really being used. It's just knowing that you've got that workplace culture that will actually support a woman um, who's going through um, domestic violence at that point. Because essentially it results in more loyalty, better productivity, for one of a better word, um, by the women who are supported. So there's Ludo McFerrin, who I always pay homage to because she was so great in, um, um, she started up one of the first safe at homes over in New South Wales and she also was instrumental in getting the domestic violence rights up in Australia as well, so some amazing work she's done. But despite improvements in gender equality, women are still experiencing um, violence at intolerable rates. And I just want to play a little video if I can. Um, this year there's been two women each week that have been murdered by their partners, which is actually this time sort of last year, it was one woman per week. So there's a, we're calling on a sort of national emergency on government and saying, come on, COAG, coalition of governments, you know, deal with this. This is, you know, not acceptable. Two women a week are dying. Um, so this is the memorial march that we hold every year. So each year we pay honour and respect to all the, the women, children, and there are some men who lose their lives as well. And it's a very sort of honouring um, and in loving memory sort of event, but it's also an opportunity for the public to come along and march silently. It is a silent march and also a forum for loved ones to come together who've lost someone um, through domestic homicide and grieve and actually share um, their experience together. So in the last three years, we've had 29 homicides. Now this is just in WA uh, in 2012, 16 in 2013, and 16 last year. So I might just play this little video. Yeah. I wake one each morning with feelings of despair and wonder at the temperament that may still be in. Shall the mood be happy, the anger will be sad. Is it fault of anyone to make us feel so bad? How shall I know? I'm without a clue. I feel I'm left in darkness. I know not what to do. Some were so unhappy, some were look so sad. It isn't your fault that Daddy gets mad. He keeps all his feelings hid deep down inside. He knows not how to talk, how to swallow his pride. So some try to be happy, some don't feel sad. It isn't your fault that Daddy gets mad. Hush, listen, that's a neck on the wall. Another chair is broken and our milk is on the floor. We've heard it all so often, we know every sound. We know when Dad's not lying down to the ground. So why do they argue and why do they fight? And why should we listen to this every night? We don't ask them to fight, we don't ask to be warned. We just lay and listen to shattered and torn. All of us, of course we wish that we weren't here in some ways. And yet, each year it is enriching and somehow incredibly special to connect on such a profound level and also on such a level 
where we all share one goal, stop domestic violence. Today is the 24th annual Silent Memorial March and we stand as a community together to honour and commemorate the women, children and men who have lost their lives to one of the most senseless of crimes. It saddens me deeply to know that 16 people have died as a result of domestic homicide since last year's March. And although this is a decrease from the 21 deaths in each of the previous two years, even one death is far too many. The fact that the WA Police received 46,874 domestic violence notifications in one year is unfathomable and totally unacceptable. In Western Australia, we are continually increasing and improving our initiatives to combat domestic violence and support the victims. We need to teach our young people about respectful, non-violent ways of relating to others and responding to conflict. And we need to give our victims a voice by raising awareness through initiatives such as the Silent March. All of this, of course, is small comfort to those who have lost a loved one. Today we march to remember 16 tragic deaths. Although our march is silent, our objection is loud and clear. Together, we refuse to accept these atrocities and vow to work together creating communities that are free from violence and abuse. barriers confronting people in family domestic violence, why they may not leave or why they may return, then they will interpret delay and vigilance of returning as indicating the person is lying about the family and domestic violence, as if it wasn't true. Because if it was, how could they possibly remain return? Our understandings about family domestic violence have a pivotal effect about how we look at information, interpret it and make decisions. We need more than laws that look good but gather dust on the shelves because they're not utilised in practice. We need laws that work. Last year, the State Attorney General Michael Mission commissioned the Law Reform Commission to review the laws in relation to family and domestic violence and the Commission handed down a report in June of this year, which the Attorney is now considering. The report, the fact the Government has commissioned it and the Government's keenness to act are a great opportunity. This is the most comprehensive review of laws in Western Australia for 11 years, and there's potentially the ability to make a real paradigm shift, to treat the laws not as being some quasi-criminal process or an adversarial process, but a protective ju jurisdiction where victim safety and the realities of domestic violence are front and centre. They drive the laws, the processes and how they operate. <laughs> many women, children and even sometimes men. Victims of domestic violence often suffer in torment and silence with most people around them having absolutely no idea it is even happening. Domestic violence comes in many forms, not only physical but mentally and emotionally also. Who's to say which is worse? I have suffered in silence with all of them at some stage of my life. In my case, I have always had issues of self-esteem, although seemingly confident for an outsider looking in. My experience of domestic violence began over 20 years ago. Typically, the relationship started off pleasant, but over the years escalated into arguments which eventually became violent. Why would a person feel the need to put their hands violently on another person? Maybe I asked for it, maybe I was too lippy, or maybe I just deserved it. You feel that low and alone that you can't confide in anybody and allow anybody into your world for fear that your secret will get out, that your partner hits you. 
People who commit domestic violence are bullies who need to be disempowered. By speaking out against domestic violence takes away that control they have and allow people the right for happiness, not to have to hide in the shame and live in total fear. I will continue to strive for both mine and my children's right to be left in peace and live our lives to the full in happiness. Everyone deserves that right. No one has the right to take that from anyone and make you feel like a nothing. I'm not a nothing, I'm a person and I'm a survivor. that event runs and um, how powerful it is essentially. And Michael Hovain who spoke there so well, he's one of our um, feminist colleagues, he, he gets it, you know, um, sometimes, you know, we ha we're lucky to have um, some men as, as really good allies, and Michael's one of them. Glad's on it. Glad's on it. And you know, we've got Dr. Wade over here, who also we hope to have speak at our next march this year, which is um, on the 27th of November in Perth, so that'll be the 25th one. I just want to have much time as I can. Just want to quickly touch on a couple of really key murders in our state that led to law reform, led to community outrage. One of them was a Andrea Pickett, who herself had actually 13 children. She was an Aboriginal woman. She had seven with her at the time that she tried to escape from her violent um, husband. Now, he um, assaulted her and actually went to prison for that for a very brief period of time. But um, he, he was released on parole and when they interviewed him in the parole process and asked him, you know, are you going to, you know, you're not going to do anything to Andrea? And he said, well, actually, I can't guarantee you her safety. And yet they still let him out on parole. So we're seeing one system failure immediately. And they actually deemed him a low risk. Um, so, you know, that sort of thing. And all this came out in the inquest because she was stabbed around 38 times. He found her, he knew where she would be with family members um, and stabbed and killed her. And during all this time, she had kept a diary and that diary, um, you know, was able to be used by the family in the inquest to show um, what was happening. Another time he um, broke into her home when she wasn't there, placed a machete on her bed and said, I love Andrea Louise Pickett. And you know, that just sent shivers up her spine, obviously. She went to the police and they took no action. In fact, they laughed at her and said, well, what do you expect us to do with this machete? So all of this came out in the inquest. I was at the inquest and gave some evidence as well. But there were some very red faces in the room, particularly from police, from corrections, and also crisis care, who actually hadn't really done a thorough job in finding her a refuge space. She was denied one when there were available beds just outside the metropolitan region. So her family demanded an inquest. They knew there'd been systems failures over a long period of time. They didn't act on breaches. They did a whole, a lot of things that got brought to the attention of the coroner. Um, and our ABC, which is Four Corners, they have an investigative journal program that they run, came to Perth and actually interviewed family members um, and a number of people and put together a program about Andrea and also Sari Jones who was the other woman I wanted to mention who was also murdered by a partner and what had happened she failed to turn up for a housing appointment and the refuge staff said well that's out of character you know 
we need to put a welfare check out. Can you go and check her partner's, ex-partner's home? So they did that. Um, but what they failed to do was actually go inside, for starters. They went there and he said, oh, actually, she's run off with the best man and left me with the children. And immediately they felt sorry for him, this poor man with the children, and left. Um, the refuge workers were frantic and said, oh no, she's got a baby that she's breastfeeding, she would never leave that child um, for any love or money, you know. Uh, they said, no, you're panicking, don't worry about it, we'll go back after the weekend. Now had they gone back at that very first point, Sari was still alive. They believe she was still alive for up to 24 hours. Um, and so they didn't go back until after the weekend. Again, another welfare check. He brought the children to the door. He didn't allow anyone to go inside. They sighted the children and he said, oh, she's just not back yet. So off the police went. Well, this time, well, this time everybody in the DVU was going, no, this is not on. Missing person, you need to enter the premises. And this was just before Christmas, 22nd of December very hot in Perth. So finally, after 10 days, they decided to enter the home and the rotting body was actually, you could smell it from the front door. And the outrage about that whole episode, what the hell was he doing with her dead body in the home with the two children running around, so to speak. And we know from the counselling that the young girl who was four at the time had said, Mummy told me she was dying and had to tell me she was going to die and leave me. And that was around 24 hour span. So he failed to get medical attention, yet when it went to court, he pleaded what we call unlawful assault causing death, which is sort of um, a one punch legislation, which mean it, it was introduced to sort of deal with the um, one punch out of control, so to speak, pub brawls where someone does get hit and dies. But what we found out, it was being used in the context of domestic violence and a number of perpetrators were getting off with two years. This chap, Bradley Jones, got off with the maximum of five years um, for murdering his wife. Um, and all they need to say is, I didn't mean to kill her. Um, and so, you know, the injustice of all this we were getting phone calls, come on guys, what are we doing? So petitions went out, we got around 3,000 petitions and, and the government at the day said, give us those petitions. We said, not on your life, because they'll sit in a dusty shelf somewhere. We're going to Parliament, we're having a rally, and we're putting them in the hands of a parliamentary committee, which we did. Um, and of course, um, that parliamentary committee reviewed our submission. I became the principal petitioner at Parliament and they deemed that we needed a review of the laws per pertaining to domestic violence in our state. Um, so, you know, the Law Reform Commission did a, 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 a report, a discussion paper, which the government, with true consultation, released it less than one week before Christmas. Everybody's wanting to go on leave, they're exhausted, particularly the non-government sector. So that was an outrage and wanting people's submissions in by the end of January when they know full well people are wanting to take some leave. So anyway, that's still in the arms of, of our Attorney General. He has sort of made some noises about, you know, bringing in some, you know, better things around domestic violence but we really haven't seen the detail in that as yet. Um, what we've also seen is the med medicalisation of women's issues. So, you know, um, the pathologising and the victim blaming is going on um, even more than ever. Um, and it's in the, it, with the decline of political activism, I think people are frightened in some way to rally to um, take direct action to do um, the things that they may once have done because funding and other things will be under threat. Um, and I guess Pen Ellen Pence said once, you know, yet 
in terms of um, counselling responses, lead the deeper social issues of violence in families um, and violence against women unexamined. So, you know, she was, you know, alluding to that, and I think a lot of the work that response-based practice does definitely examines those social and material conditions. So this approach is in stark contrast to the political advocacy for social justice and collective action that um, characterised feminised, uh, sorry, feminist services in the 70s and 80s. So just um, wary of that. So in terms of weeding out the root causes of violence, um, we've had a recent case where um, a mayor in New South Wales, the east coast of where we are, basically cautioned women not to walk al alone at night because there was a gang rape of a 17-year-old girl um, not very long ago. He said walking alone was an invitation for someone to take advantage of you and the attack of the 17-year-old girl who was on her way home from work was a salient reminder. So again, victim blaming, um, and of course there was a lot of outrage about that, um, and he is actually now having to make an apology. But what the concern is, it's people in these high places making these decisions. So as, as I said at the beginning, patriarchal and those beliefs are still alive and kicking because that should never be happening in this day and age, that that sort of commentary um, so I think, you know, we can act collectively to expose and respond to sexist, racist and homophobic and any hate crimes or inaccurate descriptions of violence, which again response-based practice we'll be talking about. Um, and I, I guess social media, you know, is another forum now where we can do that in a very instantaneous way as well. There was another comment by Judge Kelly, and I don't know if any of you saw that, about the three-year-old that was raped, I mean that was unbelievable, saying that there was no violence or callous disregard for the victim's well-being, and I'll say here, I believe Dr Wade would refer to this as an oxymoron, yeah, you know. So, I mean, saying that what he was trying to say is I won't give this guy the maximum penalty because I have empathy for him. He's not like the normal pedophilic rapist. He um, he was playing video games with the young girl. Um, she wandered off into the garage. Um, he inexplicably became sexually aroused, um, but did not appear to intend to harm the victim when he sexually assaulted her. So how do you you know reconcile any of that? These remarks were known um, were said um, because the three year old and he knew that the three year old had suffered. Um, tissue injuries and that also he had tried to cover the girl's mouth to stop her from screaming and, and resisting what was happening while her mother was running around frantically looking for her. So, you know, again, you know, colluding really with the perpetrator by trying to minimise and almost justify what was happening there. Um, outrageous. So, you know, social responses to violence have been seen on a global level. Exposing and challenging violence and oppression has come about through acts of resistance and defiance. There have been many freedom fighters, human rights activists and feminists committed to this throughout history. And I'd like to just honour a few as I finish. Um, Warrior um, Yagen, who was a, a resist resistance fighter when the genocidal attempt of Aboriginal people happened in, in our country and in our state of Western Australia. He was murdered and beheaded and his head was taken to Britain for scientific examination. It's only not that long been brought back to Perth and, and um, the statue was desecrated twice. Someone came along and beheaded it twice. Um, so talk about disrespect. Um, of course, Madiba, you know, he was integral in the defiance campaign against apartheid and, um, you know, from prisoner to president of the story, you know. Um, Angela Davis, who was a pivotal leader in the civil rights movement, imprisoned for her resistance. And she says, we have to talk more about liberating minds as well as liberating society. 
Um, so she was punished for her acts of resistance. And Aung San Suu Kyi, who was a freedom fighter against the military regime in Burma, and she says this is not the beginning. Uh, sorry, this is just the beginning, not the end. So I guess we can, you know, we can gain some really um, great sort of inspiration, I guess, from these key people who led movements. I mean, they didn't act on their own. They led movements of people against um, colonialism, violence, oppression. And then lastly, the Mirable sisters who were shot dead, assassinated for their political activism against um, an oppressive regime in the um, Republic of Dominica in the 1960s. And I guess that's what has what led to the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Most of you may be aware of that. But I think sometimes we forget it, um, that the 25th is a white ribbon day, but it's also the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And hey, if you strike the woman, you strike the rock. <coughs> Watinda of the Fuzzy, Watinda Mbokoto, which is actually um, the famous four who, who actually took 20,000 women to the Parliament of South Africa and protested against the pass laws. And that means if you strike the woman, you strike the rock. So, you know, don't be going there because, you know, it's, um, and then I guess in conclusion, Louisa Lawson, who was a suffragette and author and also the famous mo mother of Henry Lawson in Australia, he's quite famous, she said, will it believe that a hundred years hence from, from now that such a state of things existed? And she wasn't talking about um, the vote, Louise was talking about violence against women. And I guess I just want to beg that question still in 2015, why are we having so much violence against women? If you get a chance to listen to this song, this is great. This is one that talks about, you know, people will try and say, I'm speaking on your behalf. But no, they're not speaking on your behalf. If they're speaking racist, sexist or homophobic crap, basically. What she says is, you speak on behalf of me if you're speaking about things that matter, about ending apartheid, ending violence against women, etc., etc. So she's a great inspiration. She's a folk singer in Australia, and she's now a federal court magistrate. And I'm just thinking, I'd love to see how she operates now, because she was a very famous sort of activist in the um, 60s and 70s. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and wish you all well. Thank you so much.